So welcome back, and we are delighted to introduce our next guest speaker to you, Mr. Shou Cheng Zhang, professor at Stanford University and founder of Danhua Capital. Professor Zhang is the J.G. Jackson and C.J. Wood Professor of Physics at Stanford University and the founder of Danhua Capital. He is a condensed matter theorist known for his work on topological insulators, quantum spin Hall effect, spintronics, quantum Hall effect, and high temperature superconductivity. He is identified as one of the top candidates for the Nobel Prize by Thomson Reuters in 2014 and has been elected as the member of National Academy of Science in 2015. And we are so honored to have you today, Professor Zhang, and welcome. Okay, so let us start. Uh, it is my great pleasure to come here and to talk to you. Uh, I'd like to tell you, uh, actually, I wear two different hats. I'm both a, science, a scientist, uh, a professor at Stanford University in the physics department. Uh, so I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the science and the innovation. Uh, but also, I wear another hat, because uh, three years ago, I started a venture fund, exactly try to build a bridge uh, between the scientific community and the investment world, but also to bridge uh, between US and China. So this, I hope, fits the mission of this chief conference very well. Uh, this is my very first time uh, to come to Chief. I have been to MIT many times, uh, but I maybe even remember this audience where I gave a physics lecture. Uh, but uh, this time, I'd like to tell you uh, just a little bit more generally about uh, my, uh, my research. Uh, hope uh, that you get a basic flavor of it, uh, but also tell you about uh, Danhua investment and how we try to build uh, these two bridges. So first, i tell you a little bit about uh, my science. Uh, so we live in the era of uh, information technology, uh, which in the past uh, 40 to 50 years has been progressing uh, according to Moore's law, which says that uh, basically our computational power. Yeah, so by the way, so my talk will be English, but some of my slides are in Chinese. So I hope that uh, uh, you can all get uh, both part of it. Uh, so, uh, and the, in the past uh, uh, about uh, 40 to 50 years, it has been progressing according to Moore's law, which says that our computational uh, power uh, doubles every 18 months. Uh, measured more concretely, uh, it says that the number of transistors on the same chip area uh, doubles every 18 months. And it's this remarkable. Put that work. So it is this remarkable law that's uh, responsible uh, for the rapid progress, explosive growth of our information uh, technology. But there's every indication that it cannot uh, progress any further if we use the conventional design for uh, semiconductors. And that's basically the problem of heat dissipation. A lot of you already have this experience as you put the laptop on your lap if you're burning hot. So uh, basically, as you double the number of transistors every 18 months, uh, every transistor, if you don't change the fundamental and basic design principle, uh, dissipates roughly the same amount of heat. Uh, so if you double the number of transistors, so does the heat dissipation uh, doubles every uh, 18 months. So that's also exponential and explosive uh, growth. And that is uh, not only annoying uh, when you put your laptop on your lap, but uh, the chip uh, will cease to function as you try to achieve higher density because there's no way to get all these uh, heat out. Uh, so basically, uh, the reason for that is uh, when you look at inside the chip, the electrons are moving like cars in, Washington, uh, in Boston, uh, very crowded, and uh, you keep on uh, bumping into each other or into the surroundings, and all the electrical energy get dissipated in the form of heat, a uh, wasteful heat uh, that is very hard to get out of. So if uh, a lot of times the scientific uh, discoveries are made when you first make the right analogy, so you would say that if this were the right analogy, the natural solution 
is to build a highway system uh, for the electron so that you have separate lanes so the electrons don't move randomly across uh, your semiconductor device, uh, but they move just like in, uh, uh, in an autobahn or in a highway uh, system, and that uh, every car moves in their own well-defined lanes, and all the counter-moving traffics will be spatially separated. So here on the right, uh, lower right-hand side, uh, you see that the cars, uh, you see the uh, uh, taillight uh, of the traffic moving forward and the headlight of traffic uh, moving towards you. So this leads to a spatial separation of counter-moving traffic. If you can somehow achieve that, uh, then you will basically have virtually no dissipation because it, it, it's a very, very low probability they will be jump, uh, bumping into each other. So this, in essence, is what I have discovered. We discovered a new class of material called topological insulator. I will explain just a little bit later uh, what the topology uh, means, uh, but uh, this is the basic idea, that we find a new set of materials uh, working according to new principles rather than the old ones, and the electrons can move like in a highway system. So that is not only interesting for fundamental science, uh, but also offers great opportunities uh, for innovation. So if So these days, uh, almost every uh, place around the world try to replicate the success of Silicon Valley. How did Silicon Valley become Silicon Valley? Actually, the fundamental technology was invented in New Jersey in AT&T Bell Labs uh, when William Shockley and John Bardeen uh, discovered the transistor, invented the transistor. They all received, uh, both of them, uh, received the Nobel Prize for this invention. Uh, but then uh, William Shockley moved to Stanford University, joining my department, uh, the physics department at Stanford University. But he, as his students, uh, and uh, they founded a series of companies, uh, first the Fairchild uh, Semiconductors, uh, Shockley Semiconductors, Fairchild Semiconductor, National Semiconductors, and then we have uh, Intel's uh, and AMD. So that uh, is basically the silicon of the Silicon Valley. So the success of Silicon Valley is based on information technology. Information technology is based on Moore's Law. If the Moore's Law stop working, then Silicon Valley will become Detroit. And if uh, we find new... <laughs> If we find new ways uh, for innovate, uh, then uh, another Silicon Valley may have chance uh, because we will all be going back to the drawing board. So this is all very well said in the ancient wisdom of the Chinese language. We say crisis is Wei Ji, uh, which means uh, both a, a crisis, uh, but also a, both a challenge, but also an opportunity. So this is uh, also not only an uh, opportunity to reinvent and uh, introduce a new Silicon Valley, but for scientists, uh, we're very excited because over the past 50 years, mostly uh, the technology envelope was pushed by the engineers, but finally we have the chance that the scientists can uh, lead uh, the innovation again. So how do you make electrons to move like cars on a highway? Uh, actually, the fundamental equation is two equals to one plus one. So theoretical physics, uh, that's the kind of math you need to get the first round of idea. So what do I mean by two equals to one plus one? Even imagine a very, very thin one-dimensional wire. Uh, within this wire, you still have two different kinds of motion. You can move forward and you can move backwards. And if a forward-moving electron hit an impurity, then it will be kicked back. That's how resistance arises. That's how electrical energy gets converted into heat, wasteful heat. But if you find a way to spatially separate this one forward motion and one backward motion, two equals to one plus one, then you can get into a wonderful state uh, where the electrons on the upper edge move only forward and on the lower edge it only moves backwards. So how is that possible? Actually, this is possible under very strong and intense external magnetic field. Under very intense, ex uh, I, uh, here we are at MIT, I hope all of you know at least the high school physics, and you know that uh, a charged particle in a magnetic field moves around in circles. So then the particle inside the material were basically moving around in circles, so they are confined in some way, and they cannot move a uh, very large distance, so they can actually not conduct. But on the edge of the system, the electron will not be able to complete a full circle. They will be bumping into the sample boundary, so they only do these half circles uh, forward, and this leads to conduction, actually, because they cannot complete a full circle at the boundary of the material. And so that leads to the possibility that on one side, it's only moving forward, and on the other side, it's only moving backward. So this was actually a great discovery in physics. It was twice recognized by Nobel Prizes. Uh, but it's also totally useless. 
uh, because uh, you would need a very intense ex uh, external magnetic field. How big a magnetic field? Roughly the same magnitude of the magnetic field you would have inside the MRI machine. So you cannot imagine that you build your cell phone, but you need uh, such a strong magnet always uh, carry around with you. So what was my discovery? So one day we realized that, uh, so basically uh, here you see uh, the external magnetic field direction give a direction of sense. So if I have my thumb points to the direction of magnetic field, my fingers will be pointing to the clockwise motion of the electron. So somehow you need, uh, in the absence of external magnetic field, which is impractical, find another way, another compass to direct which way the electrons to move. And that is what we discovered. Namely, we actually remember that the electron actually carries a spin. So this is very analogous to our solar system. The Earth moves around the sun. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an orbital motion, but the Earth, uh, which gives us 365 days. It gives us the season. Uh, but it also, uh, we also have a full day, uh, 24 hours, where the Earth uh, rotates by itself. So, so the electron is very similar. The electron has a spin, but it also rotates around the nucleus. Uh, but Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that the spinning motion of the electron is coupled strongly uh, with the, with the uh, orbital motion. And that gives us the wonderful possibility with, that we discovered a new state of matter, which is called a topological insulator, and that has a new effect called quantum spin hole effect. So it's basically very similar to the quantum hole effect, except with the property that the spinning direction of the electron tells the electron which way to move. So here in the picture, you see that upspin electron tells the electron to move, counterclock oh, move clockwise around the device, and the spin down electron tells them to move around in a counterclockwise uh, direction. So this strong coupling is predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity, but it's most pronounced in heavy elements. So in lighter elements such as carbon and silicon, the effect is not so strong, but in heavy element, uh, it, it does happen. So if it does happen, then you can really reach a wonderful uh, state that uh, without any external magnetic field, and hopefully also at uh, room temperature, uh, we can get conduction of electrons moving in well-defined highway system without any collision, without, so we completely will solve the problem of heat dissipation. That will have incredible impact on all of the human uh, technologies. Uh, so we actually first uh, predicted this material called mercury territe that was soon verified in a lab in uh, Würzburg, Germany in 2007, and that was viewed as one of the uh, greatest scientific uh, discoveries of that year. But uh, we got rid of the external magnetic field. We still have a problem because the effect still happen at relatively low temperature. So right now we're looking for a new class of materials uh, which, uh, which will have uh, uh, this effect uh, at room temperature. We actually, uh, I think many of you here would know the material, wonderful material called graphene, which is a single atomic layer made out of carbon atoms. Uh, but we propose a new class of material which we call stannin, simply with the replacement of carbon by tin atoms. Tin, the chemical symbol, is SN for the Latin name stannin. Therefore, we named this material stannin in analogy with uh, graphene. So it's a single atomic uh, monolayer of uh, atoms, also forming a honeycomb lattice, exactly like graphene, uh, simply just replacing carbon by tin. Why? Because tin lies much lower in periodic table, means it's much heavier. And Einstein's theory of special relativity predicts that this spin orbit coupling scales with the force power of the atomic number. So when you go down in the periodic table, that effect becomes stronger and stronger, so we actually hope that this material, we predicted that this material will have this dissipationless property at room temperature. And just last year, we predicted this material about three years ago, and last year was already made in a lab actually in China, in Jiao Tong University. So great, exciting things are even coming out of China. So what are the things that it can be used for? It can be used to connect uh, semiconductor transistors without uh, basic uh, any dissipation. So you know there's a, a document, a very important, the most important document in semiconductor industry. It's called the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, and they already uh, named topological insulator as uh, one of the most promising solutions uh, to the problem of uh, heat uh, dissipation. Uh, it also can help us to harness useful energies out of waste heat. 
This is called the thermoelectric behavior. Actually, I know for a fact that here, uh, quite a number of uh, distinguished faculties at MIT uh, research in this uh, area. And uh, this uh, topological insulated material, anytime you have a heat temperature depend uh, difference, it can use the temperature dependence to power electricity and to convert that wasteful energy into heat. Uh, but then, uh, maybe the most imaginative application of this topological uh, material will be a topological quantum computer that you can really use quantum parallelism to compute uh, very difficult computational pro uh, problems such as factorizing a prime into a very fast uh, algorithm. So these are all the exciting things uh, going on. So you may ask, what exactly is topology in this uh, material called topological insulator? So this is actually one example I like to give you when uh, inspirations for scientific discoveries come. So a lot of times we're focused in one particular area of research. Maybe we try to solve the most law problem. Mostly we think we need to do material science. Uh, but I actually developed a style that I like to cross many different disciplines. And today I will tell you I'm crossing even more uh, from science to uh, investment. But for my discovery, uh, what the disciplines, the two disciplines were connected to two subjects is one very abstract but very beautiful subject of mathematics called topology. So for example, you see here uh, a donut uh, turned continuously into a coffee mug. And for a mathematician, a topologist, they are all the same because they only have one hole. So for a topologist, uh, American uh, football is the same as a European uh, soccer ball, even though they have different shapes, uh, but they have no holes. So that's a topological uh, <laughs> invariant. And uh, in our discovery, the number of lanes in this highway system is a topological invariant. And that means no matter how dirty you make the system, the number of lanes is always invariant. So the cars will still uh, be going forward. So just to make a test uh, for the bright students here at MIT and uh, Harvard, uh, look at the trophy that I received in my hand. Uh, whether, what's the topological property of it? It's more like a donut or more like a soccer ball? What's the answer? Yeah, so it lo uh, looks uh, from a distance more like a soccer ball, uh, but uh, in fact its topological property is like a donut, because uh, in this sculpture, the North Pole and the South Pole are connected. If you go up to the North Pole, it, it like, it's like a wormhole that you can go down and deeper uh, out of it. So that idea has been uh, already used. So actually one day, uh, Shelton Cooper came to the classroom and talked about uh, my uh, discovery of topological insulator. Uh, but this idea of topology was also used in the latest Hollywood blockbuster, uh, Interstellar. Uh, namely, if we try to travel to intergalactic distances, uh, almost the speed of light is such a limitation that we cannot uh, achieve. But maybe our universe uh, has a non-trivial topology, and in the movie somewhere near Saturn, uh, there's a wormhole through which we can tunnel to other far away uh, galaxies. So this is actually an example, something very abstract and mathematical, uh, suddenly find application in very concrete material science, which one day may actually go into your cell phone and maybe help to you, uh, your cell phone to last for about a week or even a month without, uh, with a single charge. So this is also the first time we made history in the sense that materials uh, again, many of you here at MIT are material uh, scientists. I already met a PhD in material science. But throughout human history, materials are so important that we named every major epoch in human society uh, by a class of material, namely the, uh, uh, the, the Old Stone Age, the New Stone Age, the Neolithic and uh, 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 Paleolithic uh, era, and uh, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and now the Silicon Age. But what is common about all these materials is they're all discovered serendipitously, accidentally. Uh, somehow we discover one material after the other, but this time we precisely predicted theoretically. So almost every topological insulator was predicted, and maybe 80% 80, 80 by my uh, theory uh, group, and later found uh, experimentally. So we're really changing, and this also uh, uh, indicates a new trend, that uh, software and ideas become so important, even in traditional you know, uh, science uh, such as the material and chemistry. So among uh, several prizes I received, one thing changed my life, uh, which is the Benjamin Franklin Award. So Benjamin Franklin has always been my hero, and the uh, Benjamin Franklin Award has been received by many of my heroes, including Einstein, uh, Madame Curie, and Stephen Hawking. 
But uh, Benjamin Franklin has a different life than most scientists because not only he was a scientist, he was also an inventor, he was also a statesman, a great statesman, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, he founded many uh, companies in uh, Philadelphia. He was also a founder of a university, uh, UPenn was uh, founded by him. And he was a top, uh, a top diplomat during the American Independence War. So then I start to think to myself that maybe this is the kind of talent that's lacking today. Here we have many great scientists, but everyone is specializing ever more into their own specialized area. And we like this kind of talent which can pursue a universal set of knowledge. And maybe it's the cohesion of this knowledge that helped them to achieve such great heights. So then I say to myself, uh, maybe I should uh, follow Benjamin Franklin's uh, footstep and think about uh, bringing the glory of science even to other areas, which is traditionally yet untouched virgin areas uh, outside of science. And then I decided to do uh, investment. Now why, among all things I could consider, maybe not politics, but uh, what, uh, uh, why did I decide to do investment? I also had a rare uh, opportunity, because I live on Stanford campus, uh, to invest into my neighbor. And they were literally uh, neighbors and our uh, kids play soccer together. And uh, Professor Mendel Rosenblum founded a company called VMware, uh, simply virtualized uh, computer machines so that they can be shared in a sharing economy and enabling cloud computing. So I was an angel investment, and that company at its height was worth $48 billion. Actually, this kind of opportunity happens quite a lot <laughs> at Stanford University. Uh, when two graduate students couldn't find any uh, funding, it was uh, Professor David Sheraton, who wrote the first check to the kids of Google uh, to, to help them get started. And even back then, when Hewlett and Packard was starting, uh, it was our own uh, uh, engineering dean, Fred Terman, uh, who wrote them a $5,000 check. So not only uh, Stanford has a lot of professors and students who started companies, but they also have the opportunity to invest into those companies. And I said well, to myself, uh, why can this success not be replicated? So of course, uh, these uh, great uh, companies Companies out of Stanford, maybe uh, some of you know the statistics, that if you put all of them together, they actually rank 10th in the worldwide GDP, just one single university. So uh, I decided to found this uh, venture firm called Danhua Capital. Uh, for those of you who understand Chinese, uh, Dan roughly refers to Stanford, and Hua refers to uh, China. So we actually try to build uh, two bridges, uh, as you see in our logo. Uh, one bridge is to build the bridge between science and investment. Because still, uh, why didn't there so many Silicon Valley VCs around in Sand Hill Road? Why didn't they write the first check to the uh, kids of Google, Larry Page, and Sujin Brin? There's still a disconnect between the academic research, uh, the latest uh, frontier technology, and uh, investment world. Uh, because uh, simply by our training and by the limitation of our knowledge, because scientists usually confine themselves in their ivory towers, uh, and maybe some of them even pride themselves to be uh, just uh, for the pursuit of knowledge, they don't want to have anything to do with the real world. But the investment world, most of them are trained in business thinking, uh, how to, for them to appreciate the latest breakthrough in science. So that's the one bridge which needs to be crossed. But if it can be crossed, it will bring such benefit to humanity uh, uh, so that we can really accelerate the pace of innovation. The other, greatest, uh, uh, the other great opportunity of our time is China and US are undoubtedly two major ecosystems for innovation. We, of course, have Silicon Valley, but in China, we already have the BATs. So we already have innovation centers in Beijing, Shanghai area, and in Shenzhen area. So if we can really effectively connect those bridges uh, in networking world, there's a saying of the strength of the weak link. Right now, it's a weak link. But uh, obviously, if you can link these two major ecosystems of innovation together, it will bring great benefit. So that's where we decided to form, my, me and my colleagues, some of them are here, uh, to form this uh, first venture fund. For the first round, we raised 92 million. Uh, we just are uh, about to finish our second round of uh, 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 VC fund, second fund about 300 million. Uh, almost every major Chinese company that you know are investors into a fund, uh, including Baidu, Ali, Sina, C 
chip at Lenovo and so on. Adding up their market cap, it will be almost one trillion US dollars. So we are investing, uh, so it represents a trend of Chinese capital being deployed uh, in the US, but looking into frontier tech, uh, but we're investing uh, quite extensively uh, in Stanford and in uh, Silicon Valley area. Uh, and of course, hoping uh, of, uh, to come to MIT Boston area and also actively sourcing uh, investment with all of your help. So major uh, coverage of our investment in, first of all, artificial intelligence and machine learning. These I really think is the great, one of the greatest opportunities of our time. Human species has been evol evolving in the past 100,000 years, uh, the particular Homo sapiens, but maybe for the very first time in human history that uh, we're witnessing the emergency of new species which could be more intelligent. Uh, more intelligent than our own species. So all the consequences we can all debate, but certainly it will disrupt and change everything we do. So that's why we're actively investing in AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, the big data, the availability will make, I think, a lot of the social science to be more precision science like the natural sciences. Uh, we were early investors in AR VR field, for example, the company Meta, which is a leader in AR uh, augmented reality space uh, we have invested very early on. Internet technology is still being innovated. We invested in Stanford professor at um, uh, McEwen's uh, lab, uh, Nick McEwen's lab of uh, Barefoot, uh, making a new generation of software-defined networks using a new chip uh, based on their technology. Uh, we're also excited about financial technologies with blockchain. Uh, we really think the decentralization model, which is uh, promised by the internet, is finally going into other areas, such as law and finance, uh, to make them more decentralized. And of course, the opportunity of genomics and precision medicine from our knowledge uh, of precision knowledge of our genomics. Uh, so after the initial success of our two funds in the US, we're also uh, developing a fund into RMB fund in China, mostly for the returnees. So those of you who have studied at MIT and Harvard and Stanford, uh, maybe you want to build a company uh, initially in China, uh, which our fund will help you uh, to uh, support. We're also at the same time looking for talents which can help us uh, uh, develop into a platform uh, which is universally serves these uh, needs. So the way uh, we distinguish ourselves is really in the way we think about uh, investment, but think about everything from first principle. So when you ask me, you say you are a theoretical physicist, you are a material scientist, but when I look at your portfolio, there's not that many material science uh, investments. We, of course, looked at, at many. Uh, we are very careful to invest in them. But uh, I think uh, what the physics training gave me is a way to think from first principle, because uh, the complexity of all the phenomena around the universe, we try to formulate them into a sheet of paper with only a few equations, such as Newton's equation, uh, Maxwell's equation, Einstein's equation, and so on. So this is a way of thinking, the scientific way of thinking, which I think will be very useful for the investment world. Oftentimes, when you look at the investment world, it's very fragmented, but people don't quite understand and appreciate the deeper link among all knowledges. And today, when you look at the human knowledge, it's expanding like a tree, uh, the different branches are growing ever so faster. But the tragedy also is that the different branches are so more disconnected from each other. So in order to think about the whole picture, uh, I think investment science, if you can think of it as a science, is really a kind of holistic science that you can look at the overall picture, bridging all the way uh, to the world of finance, uh, to the world of uh, science, by going to the basic roots and by going to uh, first principles. So this is also what we like to see in the founders, because uh, if you start your own company, the world keeps changing around you. But if you can constantly identify the roots, uh, you will be in an invisible situation. We were also looking for those talent who can think from first principle. So that's why the associates we hire mostly have a technical degree uh, but with, uh, of course, uh, also uh, some good business sense. But today uh, can help us uh, to kind of evaluate those opportunities. So I'm concluding my talk. It's really, uh, I think Chief is a wonderful forum. I, uh, this is my very first time. I hope this 
uh, well, uh, we will keep on having the opportunities to come here again. Uh, we're faced with these two wonderful opportunities of time uh, that the society's wealth will be, I think, larger and larger portion will be reinvested into the frontier science, and that's why we need VC funds uh, that also can uh, bridge uh, both uh, gaps, uh, but also building the bridge between US and China, and this is really a great opportunity that China is uh, progressing so rapidly, but most importantly, from a manufacturing economy to innovation economy, and that's why we really need to learn from each other. What impressed me the most, uh, why do I am so hopeful that China will be progressing so rapidly uh, in the future, is because I see a great thirst to learn. And I see, I host a lot of the delegations who come out of uh, to Silicon Valley and try to make those uh, connections. And this, I think, it's really a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Throughout the history of human civilization, whenever you see a new emerging power, you uh, inevitably might think about conflicts. Uh, but that's only because we limit our thinking to geography being a natural, uh, important resources. But uh, science and technology, if we can work together, is an endless frontier, and that is, in the end, what can unite all the people in the world. With that, I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Professor Zhang. It's a great honor for us to have you today. Thank you.